Our first speaker um, is Terry Nolan, who, who doesn't really need to be introduced. And he's going to give us an optimistic talk on the bright horizon of new and better vaccines. Terry, welcome. Thanks, Lou. Hi, everyone. And thanks, uh, Lou and the organisers for this chance, which began with a question about speaking with a retrospective. And I thought, um, that's actually not very interesting for me at all. I'd much rather talk about the future. So um, that's what I've done. And I, I, to tell you the truth, I hate uh, talking without data, um, by and large. And But this sort of thing has to be more of a horizon scan. So um, apologies in advance for um, any of the omissions that will inevitably have occurred in, in my view of what, where things have happened, particularly uh, through and post COVID um, and with announcements with um, various new partnerships, which I'll come to shortly. Um, these are my disclosures, which will be part of the uh, recorded presentation for those who really want to examine that. The, the most important one is the yellow one at the bottom. Again, part of my disclaimer that um, what I've got in some of these slides may already be out of date because all of this is moving really fast. Uh, this morning, we're going to have a big session on COVID vaccines and COVID more generally. Um, but uh, as a starting point, rather than going through and looking at the whole landscape of how wonderful um, and how um, uh, efficient vaccines have been in terms of delivering global population health, um, reviewing what's happened with COVID in very simple headline terms is a good place to start. This estimate of in the first year, that is in 2021, um, more than 20 million lives were likely to have been saved by the new COVID vaccines. These estimates come from a modelling study um, which looked at both direct um, and indirect aver averted deaths uh, that have occurred over time. This is in the calendar 2021. And and then attributed it to the individual vaccines. So these are est point estimates and confidence intervals around those estimates of the different vaccines for the global contribution to life saved. And you'll see that the, sorry, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine um, has been responsible for something, this is a, um, in that year, and, and, and obviously since then even much more than this, but over 6 million likely, um, the, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, a bit less than that, and then the, um, uh, the whole cell vaccines, Moderna, because of its volume, a bit less and so forth. But this is a wonderful achievement that uh, we mustn't let the rest of the community forget as we move forward now into using the, um, what we've learned from COVID to actually advance more broadly what's happening with communicable disease control. The reason why this has happened, of course, is that the vaccine platform base on which um, the opportunities for those new vaccines has been expanded. This is from Andy Pollard's um, uh, review paper. Uh, and it really just emphasizes that it's really, in, in particular, the viral vector vaccines and the nucleic acid vaccines, and mainly mRNA, uh, more recently, initially with Ebola and then with the SARS vaccines, um, has been uh, on top of all of this, in particular, the recombinant protein, which was earlier technology, but has been exploited very successfully as well um, with uh, what's happened with the COVID response. The, the interesting thing for me about the mRNA story is that the, um, the research history and the discovery history that made it all happen um, have been going on for quite some time. Um, of course, back, sorry, back in the 60s with the discovery of mRNA, um, it started this, uh, paper here, this contribution showing that using a, a, a lipid uh, vehicle to allow entry of mRNA into the cells was crucial, obviously, in making this technology work. And then the nucleoside stabil stabilization, which was also an important part of controlling the cell's response to, uh, to foreign mRNA, uh, proved to be also crucial in, uh, in delivering uh, successful mRNA vaccines. The first time I saw uh, human results from an mRNA vaccine was in uh, Ljubljana um, at the European Pediatric ID meeting in July of 2019, when the phase one results were shown for the, they had an H7 and an H10 uh, uh, pandemic flu candidate. 
with uh, results that um, blew out of the water the responses that have been got for, uh, for many years looking at H5 and other flu, pandemic flu candidates. And uh, it was quite clear at that time that something was really uh, pretty good with the mRNA technology. And then of course, six months later, it was all happening with SARS. This is just from NIH recently that again, just to um, explain that there are many possibilities that mRNA technology brings to targeting for vaccines, including having multiple targets in the same vaccine. So um, obviously looking for a universal flu vaccine for a stalk or some other epitope that's conserved is one approach which uh, so far hasn't delivered um, what everyone wants. But the other alternative is just volume, if you like, covering every single epitope that might be possible um, for every single variant. Um, and, and the mRNA technology theoretically makes that possible, and, and some people are working on that. So I'm not saying this is going to work, but it's just a, an example of how mRNA does deliver a range of new opportunities that are, are not available with proteins, for example. In selecting uh, new vaccine targets, um, of course, the first the starting point should always be unmet need. That might be because the vaccines we've got at the moment are not that great, including flu vaccine. They're good, but not great, pertussis, um, a range of others, TB, of course, um, or where there's no vaccine at all. And that's been the case in the past um, uh, with RSV, for example, and other uh, important targets. The companies, of course, themselves consider all sorts of issues in doing this. They're not motivated uh, by money or not purely by money, as, as many people would um, sometimes think, concerned about medical, about public health issues, of course, they, they have to face the commercial reality of opportunity, what the competitor landscape looks like, and also the scientific feasibility. And now, fortunately, the, the better, larger vaccine companies do have a serious consideration of both the wealthy country markets and also the low and middle income country markets and thinking about choosing targets, choosing clinical development for vaccines that might or might not end up being commercial. But frameworks, including Gavi and many others now that make it possible for vaccines that aren't going to be vaccines for rich countries, malaria is one TB to, a, to a, an extent as well, um, but nonetheless need support to be developed. And, and that the good companies do take that very seriously. More broadly, uh, in thinking about vaccine development, um, and this has uh, very much happened with COVID, thinking about vulnerable patient groups, um, that is, particularly those with immune compromise, the discussion last night around that was still not really sold that well, uh, even with all of the tools that we now have for COVID, um, both at a practical level, including evasion, but also in delivery. There's some really practical issues with delivery, which we're not, we're not doing very well at. Uh, pregnancy continues to be an opportunity for delivery, both to protect pregnant women, but also to protect um, their offspring, especially in the period in early infancy before they can be protected with active uh, or passive uh, vaccination, which is directed at the neonate. Children more generally, and of course the elderly, which has through COVID um, suddenly become, uh, uh, after many, many years of many of us trying to have a life course view of what happens with immunization, suddenly it's brought that into focus that this is something that um, everyone has to take much more seriously. The likely cost effectiveness is also an issue um, as it is for any pharmaceutical product. And that has to do with the burden of disease, the, the cost of goods for a product and the development cost and many other things that go into producing a new vaccine. There are of course exceptions when um, the condition that's targeted um, has particular immediate life-threatening consequences. And generally uh, payers um, have a different threshold for uh, those sorts of conditions. And a, generally on behalf of their communities will apply uh, a more lenient threshold for acceptability of, of uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. We've also seen through COVID um, the emergence of, uh, um, with great clarity, the whole issue of, um, of vaccine confidence, which was well and truly there, of course, and has been for a long time, but especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, vaccine hesitancy is an awkward concept and one which I think has been misunderstood and misapplied. But nonetheless, in vaccine development, having a tolerability profile in the, in the light of a, uh, of a consumer um, market, which is much more sophisticated and better informed than it ever has been before, is something now that um, companies will take very seriously. 
the level of um, tolerability for minor reactogenicity. Some of the discussion last night um, was around what's effectively minor reactogenicity, especially with the mRNA vaccines. Um, many of us were concerned that they were going to really um, become major problems in the context of the pandemic, as it turned out, they weren't major problems. I'm talking about systemic illness being off work with you know, malaise and fever and so forth. Um, so that um, my guess is that there's a level of tolerance for minor reactogenicity, which might have been conditioned uh, to a slightly higher threshold than before. My, I might be wrong about that, but nonetheless, no one wants to produce a product that's going to be markedly reactogenic. And I'm not talking now about the rarer and more important serious side effects um, of vaccines. Competitive advantage will also be an issue, and that includes issues of the cost of development, cost of production, utility and also the storage, particularly if there is a low temperature requirement for storage. And there are all sorts of real world reality demands, but the reason I created this slide was just to emphasize that even though the new technologies suddenly present a whole range of opportunities for new targets, the new targets should really be filtered through this sort of framework rather than just saying, oh, we'll do it because we can and produce a product that's um, nice to have, but frankly, doesn't really meet need. Um, later on today, Peter Richmond's going to talk about RSV, which is a pity because I'm um, very actively involved with RSV in a number of ways. And um, those of you who hadn't noticed will have, um, I, sh I think as I am, very, be very pleased to hear that at the end of last year, 2022 turned into a red letter year for RSV vaccines because all of a sudden, interim analyses appeared for several candidates that um, after many, many years, um, frankly, going back 60 years of RSV vaccine development, we now have several vaccines that appear to be very effective. Uh, admittedly, right now, from these, none, none of the results of any of these four products that are on this slide have yet appeared in peer-reviewed detail, so we don't know for sure. So they're really basing this assessment on what we've heard from public disclosure, usually by the manufacturer. Um, but nonetheless, uh, very encouraging. I've been on the DSMB for one of these studies, so I have seen the data and I know a bit more about it than I can speak about today. So the GSK vaccine, first of all, um, with, with in highlighted terms here, the vaccine eff uh, efficacy estimates, it, there are different thresholds here and different criteria for what you mean by severe, what you mean by low respiratory tract disease and so forth. But um, it, for the GSK candidate, which is a recombinant, an adjuvanted recombinant protein, the adjuvant is the same adjuvant as in Shingarix, but at half the dose. Um, but basically, a severe RSV um, VE of 94% and a VE of 82.6% for any uh, LRTD. Uh, wonderful results. Pfizer have pre announced um, an interim VE of nearly 82% for their maternal candidate. Um, and that's, that's against uh, respiratory tract illness in infants of, uh, born to those mothers who've been vaccinated. And their older uh, adult studies similarly in interim analysis with a VE um, for more severe disease of around um, 85%. The Moderna vaccine similarly, which is the first non-COVID vaccine mRNA candidate to show interim results. And of course, um, they're delighted with this because they um, have yet to show that they are more than just a one vaccine company, but um, VE in the mid 80% range, um, depending on the criterion that was used in a huge study in 60 years and older. And Janssen have an adenovectored uh, vaccine, which com uh, combines both the vector and also the, pro the prefusion proteins, an interesting approach. Um, similarly, showing very good results from a phase two um, but going into the second, se second and third season. So showing a durability response. Again, as we discussed last night, the whole question with these vaccines is going to be whether annual revaccination will or will not be required, um, which has all sorts of consequences. So most of these studies are going into second and third years, some with arms to reboost, some against arms which are not boosted. So there will be data on this um, down the track. The other big thing I think for the future, at least from my perspective as a pediatrician, is CMV. Um, so most people, including healthcare providers, don't really understand how important CMV is, and certainly there's a level of naivety in the population about cytomegalovirus. But it is the most common infectious cause, infectious disease cause of birth defects, and is a major cause of um, childhood hearing loss and neurological disability. 
more important than Down syndrome, for example, or fetal alcohol syndrome. So there are estimated to be something like 450 children born in Australia annually with congenital CMV related disease. And about 10% of infected newborns will produce symptomatic disease from that range of conditions that's listed on this slide. So um, Moderna have a six component mRNA vaccine, which is in phase three, including in Australia, we're one of the recruitment sites for this study in healthy um, young women aged between 16 and 40, also following up those that become pregnant and have children. So th this is a little way off, but at least it's in a major phase three and it might be the next big thing after RSV and possibly um, group B strep to follow, but I, I'm not going to go into that in detail. We will expect to see advances in the next five years uh, uh, with further refinements with uh, malaria, with the successor to RTSS, uh, with the, the new generation TB vaccines, group B strep, as I've mentioned, C. diff, Staph aureus, the next generation MenB um, vaccines, from the existing manufacturers are in advanced phase threes uh, and their penavalent vaccines, the ABCYWs are well and truly down the track and they are going to be appearing shortly as well. A lot of interesting gonorrhea beyond Vexero or other MenB vaccines potentially being uh, effective against gonococcus as well as meningococcus, but targeted gonorrhea vaccines are also in the pipeline. Chlamydia is a big target for some of the, several of the major manufacturers and um, Camille Locke's live attenuated pertussis vaccine, which has been around for a while, is now in a phase one, two, including in Australia and the UK. Um, and that might well be um, another thing that we really need. The vaccine manufacturer, thinking now about what's happened uh, just recently, um, as a result of COVID, what um, the world has learned is how to produce at scale uh, vaccines in a very short period of time. So mRNA and recombinant protein, as well as vector vaccines, can be produced at massive scale. We've seen that, and also with speed from startup to delivery. Behind that has been the, the, the what looks like a pretty gradual transition away from egg embryo flu vaccine production to cell-based production. The clinical trials that the regulators are requiring for uh, the cell-based vaccines to demonstrate efficacy as well as uh, immunogenicity um, are happening now. And so they are starting um, to appear. They're not yet replacing egg embryo, of course, because the global capacity requirement is still huge for flu, especially for pandemic possibilities. But that is another um, thing that's really been gathering pace. The other thing that's really important is a recognition through this sort of the whole vaccine sovereignty issue, including for our own uh, needs in Australia is that the access to technology and also GMP facilities for manufacture, there are now approaches to actually make that available more globally um, to countries that where the lead time for that might be 10 years or more, even if there are unlimited funds. There are ways, which I'll show you in a minute, um, to be able to make that happen. In fact, I'll show it to you now. So BioNTech, for example, has this concept called a biointainer. So what you can see on this slide is um, six shipping containers, three on top and three on the bottom. I beg your pardon, there are 12, six on the top and six on the bottom, all modularized and then bolted together and basically a portable factory. So they can build their GMP facility in an accredited way and then move it to Africa. And that was the idea of this happening. Uh, and in fact, this might be one of the ways in which we're gonna see BioNTech manufacturer uh, in Australia shortly. I'll come back to that. So this, this is an amazing concept, frankly, and the, the way in which this will both, uh, what I'm not showing is the price, which I don't know, but I know this isn't cheap, but by contrast, doing this by building a factory on new ground and going through all of the accreditation is a massive logistic and expensive exercise. The regulatory approvals and all the rest of it are huge. So um, this talk is heavily influenced by mRNA. It's not because that's the only thing that's important, but it is where there is a lot of the action at the moment. So I don't make an apology for it, but I am gonna show you um, a little bit of a horizon scan as what, of what's happening with mRNA vaccines. Broadly speaking, the target classes, um, as I mentioned before, are looking for alternatives to existing vaccines um, such as flu. Um, and we don't yet know whether the mRNA flu candidates will do better. 
uh, in terms of um, efficacy than the existing uh, vaccines. The latent viruses, um, CMV, Epstein-Barr, HIV, of course, Zoster and HSV2, are all targets, particularly suited to mRNA application. Um, the global health vaccines, the TB, malaria, neglected diseases, and so on. And then combinations, um, multiple disease targets, or within individual diseases, multiple epitopes within the same construct um, is now what this technology makes possible. So Moderna is fast-tracking 15 pathogens in the clinical studies, they say, by 2025. Um, I'll show you on the next slide some of those that are already in trials, um, but the, their targets are listed on that slide. But they've also prioritised HIV, TB, and malaria. Pfizer and BioNTech, um, flu, zoster, TB, malaria, HIV, and HSV2. And the other players in this who've come a little bit later, um, including Sanofi, who had acquired... Uh, Translate Bio um, have targets with um, both RSV and flu and others in the pipeline. GSK and CureVac, BioNet Asia, or now called BioNet, similarly is moving away from DNA to R mRNA. Securus has a major interest in um, self-amplifying uh, uh, mRNA, and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, Curis, the Chinese have also already got mRNA candidates, and there are others uh, in, in, the, in the market. The Moderna epitopes, the, the whole point about a vaccine is, to, is of course, the platform's important and what it does to both B cells and, and T cell immunity, but it's the target. If the target epitope isn't the right target, then you're not at first base. So finding the right targets is crucially important. I'm just on this slide listing some of those just to make it clear that they're not all the same and not necessarily obvious. I mentioned the CMV. There are six distinct RNA sequences in that 1647 vaccine um, to actually um, have a chance at getting at this virus. Um, RSV, uh, it's a pre F um, form uh, of uh, uh, that protein, which is the target for this mRNA. Uh, quadro, the flu vaccines for mRNA are all effectively hemagglutinin vaccines, similar to flu block in effect, um, because they're targeting just the HA. Combination vaccines, COVID, flu, and RSV, um, they have a candidate, EBV, HIV, Zika and uh, a bivalent uh, human metanumovirus and parainfluenza virus also um, on the Moderna uh, drawing board. And for BioNTech, Sanofi and uh, CureVac GSK, <coughs> so, uh, BioNTech, are, these are communicable disease candidates now. And by the way, this talk, I'm saying nothing about cancer and uh, uh, genetic disease and the other potential applications of mRNA, just focusing on communicable disease. Sanofi's RSV and also flu candidate, and then CureVac RSV with the rabies candidate. These are the these are the trial the phases of the trials now. So these are all happening right now. So the RSV one I've just shown you the data in, from the interim analysis of the RSV for the phase three in the elderly for Moderna's RSV candidate. The CMV is well and truly uh, under recruitment in dozens and dozens of countries globally, including Australia. Their flu phase three is well advanced. We will probably be seeing results of that uh, shortly. The COVID and flu, there's a, a bivalent vaccine in phase two, three, Zika. And then the others in phase one, or were in phase one, they may have moved in the last few months out of that, I'm not sure. BioNTech uh, Pfizer is still relatively early. We haven't seen any data from this yet, or at least I haven't. And then the, uh, the others listed on this slide. Self-amplifying RNA is an interesting um, thing, and, and early on, um, the major one, the majors, Moderna and BioNTech, were interested in self-amplifying mRNA, but decided not to pursue that path. Um, subsequently, now, because there are successful products which um, do contain uh, naked uh, uh, mRNA, um, the pressure to find an alternative to that by using this technology probably has uh, been uh, reduced a bit for them. It's similar and requires the same sort of facilities, but the real advantage is um, that it has much less uh, in terms of the um, molecular requirement within the vaccine because it does self-amplify. Um, so it, uh, in addition to the targeted codon, it contains a sequence encoding four non-structural proteins and that forms a replicase responsible for amplification of that um, mRNA. 
is also a subgenomic promoter of viral origin that initiates transcription. Um, so what that means, though, is that the actual dose required is, is much, much less than it is in a conventional mRNA vaccine. So when you're starting to put together many different targets in the same vaccine, the amount of mRNA and the reactivenessity associated with that starts to become complicated. So having an, a, an, a SAM uh, RNA may help with that. But in addition to that, it's also possible that um, uh, you can code for uh, scaffolds or adjuvants or other components of the vaccine other than the target epitope, which may facilitate the targeting of the vaccine. So you're just coding for another protein. It might have nothing to do with the target, but the way in which the, the target epitopes then are presented to the immune system might be a uh, help. So I think this space is going to, we're going to see, I know some of the major companies are looking very hard at this, and it may well be that there'll be some uh, advances. The SAM um, RNA COVID vaccines, I think later on, Gary, Gary's going to talk about COVID vaccines, so I won't go into this, but just to let you know that there are already several candidates. Some of them have already dropped out. Robin Shattuck's SAM candidate from Imperial has dropped out. It, it did not work. Um, so there have been some failures already, but this is a, a space to watch. Briefly, on target populations now, changing gears a bit, the elderly, as I've mentioned, um, have suddenly come into focus with COVID and suddenly um, how to reach the elderly, how to look at um, improving the immune response, taking um, account of immunosenescence, which we've always known about, is now um, something which is um, much more focused. Um, similarly, for pregnant women, it was really, from my perspective at least, it was the 2009 flu pandemic where the importance of vaccination uh, in pregnancy for flu really changed the thinking, especially amongst healthcare workers. And prior to that, getting pregnant women vaccinated with uh, flu vaccine was extremely difficult. Um, but it, it really has changed the thinking. And then subsequently now, uh, with the introduction of Tdap into the, um, uh, into the pregnancy uh, scheduling, and, and its proven success has added value to that whole concept. And now with RSV and then Group B strep on the horizon, pregnancy is going to become even more important, both to protect the mother, but also the infant in early infancy. And then finally, Indigenous hard to reach and disadvantaged populations. In Australia, we learned a lot about how to do that well. Some states, including this state, did it superbly. Um, in reaching uh, migrant populations, indigenous populations, and other um, non-English speaking groups uh, in ways that were uh, very creative and sensitive to how those communities operated rather than just having a one-size-fits-all approach. So I think that sophistication we've learned uh, will, I hope, uh, be retained and be part of our, um, a, more, uh, a more refined approach to delivery in the future. In Australia, um, there are interesting developments happening. The first is a Group A strep um, initiative uh, led by Jonathan Karapetis and Andrew Steer. Um, they have identified a lead candidate. Um, it's a, not an Australian candidate, but it's going to have co-development with the money that um, has been contributed uh, from Australian government funds. Um, and so that's all happening at the moment. The um, Human Infection Challenge Clinical Trial Facility has just been established um, in, in Melbourne at Doherty that's been spun out as a company, which is an interesting way of doing it. We'll see what happens with that. But all of a sudden now we're going to have uh, uh, sophisticated human challenge capability in Australia. And for example, COVID vaccines, we have two um, COVID vaccines developed um, a protein uh, from the Doherty and an mRNA candidate for receptor binding domain directed um, variant directed uh, vaccine candidates. The phase one of that is now fully recruited and the interim analysis of that is about to be announced. There are three other candidates, two at the Doherty and one at the University of Sydney, which are also on a pathway to go into human trials. And the last one is Nick Petrovsky's vaccine about which I'll say no more other than it continues to be an interesting story. So this is from the NCIRS, the National Center for Immunization and Research, a very helpful tabulation of what's happening with COVID vaccines in Australia. This is one of the tables from that report, which shows um, the clinical trials that are happening uh, in Australia at the moment. And reading down this table, you'll see that um, there's a lot going on, uh, which is fantastic of different phases, phase one through to phase three. 
Um, but there are only two vaccines which are Australian vaccines. One is, is the um, Spikogen vaccine from Flinders, and the other is the, the two vaccines that I've just mentioned here. So we need in Australia, I think, more energy directed to developing our own candidates. And that is the basis for some of the thinking going on now on the next two slides, next few slides. First is developing manufacturing capability for mRNA in Australia. So that's all happened now after a very painful execution of an approach to market uh, tender call. Uh, Moderna um, uh, are establishing a major commercial scale manufacturing facility in Melbourne. The groundbreaking ceremony on the right there was in December. Um, it's on Monash land, and but it's a full-scale production and formulation facility. BioNTech also, um, through uh, mRNA Victoria, have established a, um, a partnership, and BioNTech will build a clinical-scale mRNA manufacturing facility also in Melbourne, only for research and clinical trials, though not for full commercial uh, production. Um, and there is also um, uh, other... Uh, IP and um, capability that BioNTech is bringing to that, including some of their artificial intelligence um, capability. Um, and then finally, New South Wales uh, has announced a major investment in a, what they, what's called pilot capacity, which means for clinical trials effectively in animal studies, <coughs> uh, with an industry partner not yet announced. There are others, including Bionet, which is the Thai uh, French company, uh, which uh, is a very interesting company uh, focused on delivering to Asia, Asia and also to India, um, but also are now moving, as I mentioned before, into mRNA with a possibility of manufacturing here. With Associated with this capability are R&D uh, developments. So, uh, and what, what I've listed here are those that are announced with some of the commercial partners for uh, academic slash uh, commercial partnerships to build research capability. So uh, Moderna have announced a number of partnerships with universities around the world. This list might be out of date now, but in Australia it includes uh, uh, Doherty and Melbourne University, James Cook, and also um, I think UQ is there, is it? Or is there one other Australian university? Oh, Burnett, um, and uh, with Oxford and McGill and others. Um, so that really provides access to, um, to mRNA capability for research uh, targets and uh, is a, a great uh, thing. BioNTech are doing a similar thing, establishing what they've called the Asia Pacific mRNA Clinical Research uh, Facility. Um, and that will contribute to a global network of R&D. With Korea, mRNA Victoria um, has established a partnership with the Korean government through their um, Health Industry Development Institute, um, which is um, not, they're not manufacturer at the moment, but something that's going to improve um, collaboration with their focus on R&D and mRNA. And Pfizer have a, established an industry fellowship program and other forms of uh, research investment. Sanofi have recently announced um, a partnership with the Queensland government uh, and are establishing a translational science hub focusing on developing mRNA technology located across Queensland. This is from their press release, um, but um, I know that Sanofi are planning to have a much broader involvement than just the Queensland universities and the ones that are listed here, and a very ambitious plan and an interesting pipeline as well that Australian participation and collaboration with will be a fantastic opportunity, starting with chlamydia. Things that, from my perspective, uh, we've learned and, uh, and built on in COVID, including, um, but are not restricted to what's on this slide. First is that more generally globally, we've learned how to do clinical development much faster by moving to a parallel rather than a serial model, uh, which you'll all understand, and also to do that at scale. That's happening at the moment. The money that both Pfizer and Moderna have generated internally, they've poured into their own R&D. And those earlier slides I showed you of dozens of, literally dozens of clinical trials being done is one of the um, consequences of that. And a, and a sense of uh, ability to actually accelerate those, um, those outcomes. Nearly finished. Um, the genomics platform and linkage, we heard some of that yesterday from um, the presentations. Uh, that, that linkage of genomics capability around the country is, is really, had started, but it hadn't really got as far as it needed to go. Safety vigil vigilance, really important, and establishing uh, OSVAC safety, safe big. Uh, waves in uh, Western Australia have all contributed to that infrastructure. 
We're going to hear from Trish later on this morning about what's happening with modelling. NHMRC wisely invested in capacity building for modelling in the early 2000s. So people like Jody uh, McFernan and James McCaw, um, Emma and um, James Wood and a number of others, including Trish, who was one of the first uh, PhD students to arise in that program, was a payoff for that far-sighted investment. I haven't got time to talk about the economic evaluation now, but COVID has taught us that there's much more to the economic value of vaccines in the uh, pandemic context than we had realised, particularly thinking about macroeconomic factors. And then finally, the real world evidence dimension to this. Um, we're not up to where Claylit in Israel, um, ICS in Ontario, and what's happened with Public Health England and elsewhere have reached with their ability to rapidly evaluate vaccine performance. Uh, we can do it in a little modest ways, but I think this is a real opportunity for us to build further capability including with the, some of the assets we have. This is a recent paper in MJA. Alan Cheng and I were involved with um, helping Stacey Vo do this study, but a very large scale value linkage study, too little of which is being done in Australia at the moment. So I'll finish by saying that um, I hope you can share my enthusiasm for the fact that we're now in possibly one of the most exciting periods for communicable disease control since the first vaccines were discovered. These new tools that science has provided to us give us new opportunities which are massive. And that COVID experience has produced a, a lot of learnings that are really going to help us move that forward. Thank you. Terry, thank you. Dr. Jenner would be very excited. Um, questions and comments, please. Terry, we're all enthusiastic about these new developments, but is the public gonna be as enamored as we are, you know, given the reluctance of uh, second and third and fourth doses of COVID uh, for a potentially deadly disease. We can't even get them on board for that. Uh, yeah. How do you get them on board with all of this? Yeah, so we've, I've noticed that refractiveness um, just in recruiting for some of the clinical trials we're doing. There, there is, and I know this has happened in the UK and elsewhere too. Um, it's one manifestation of what you just described, a, le a level of fatigue from the whole vaccine experience. So I, look, I, honestly, I think that'll settle in time. Uh, I think the opportunities, some of these new targets, including RSV, there's not a huge amount of public awareness of the importance of these. Um, we started with RSV 10 years ago, Peter Richmond and I were involved in some of the early Novavax pregnancy study uh, and others. Um, and we had a real job just to help potential recruits, that is pregnant women for these studies who had no idea, unless they'd had a, an unusual what they'd had a personal experience with, and some had. Um, CMV is 10 times worse than that. People haven't got a clue about CMV. Um, so I think a le there is a level of responsibility for us all to convey this excitement that I've tried to demonstrate here today, Ian. Uh, but I'm optimistic that that will happen, and it, we won't, it won't, there won't be a backlash, I think. I think on the safety side, I think despite all the, all the fuss about myocarditis, for example, and thrombocytopenic, uh, thrombosis and so forth. Um, by and large, I think that's left people in a, a, a better understanding of risks, but an acceptance that that is part of the benefit package that you get broadly. You know, of course, there are some who are never, including Nick Petrovsky. Um, I don't know if you've seen a recent thing from him. I got some spam email from them about um, related to Djokovic winning uh, in the open that um, the, Australian, the tyranny of the Australian government in forcing people to be immunised and uh, uh, had there been an effect on players, um, tennis players from around the world as a result of their vaccinations that it was, will result in a reduction in talent in it's madness. Uh, um, there's a question here. Um, thanks, Terry, for a great overview as always. Um, I think one of the challenges COVID has thrown up is really the concept of duration of immunity particularly against uh, mucosal infections. Um, do you think we're going to have respiratory mucosal vaccines? Is that, is that a possibility or is that just going to be too hard from a regulatory point of view? Yeah, so, um, and I, this talk would have gone on for three hours if I'd covered all those bases, but of course that's the key issue with the COVID vaccines, that we don't have vaccines that protect against transmission. And, um, and that's become an issue. Fortunately, as, the, um, as we heard from Shemez last night in particular, uh, with the emergence of, of the later variants, the severity has reduced. And, and in fact, getting to a point where if it's a really trivial infection, the infection itself being the best form of being vaccinated because it's highly transmissible, though it doesn't actually make you very sick. 
I don't really think we're there anywhere near that, of course, with COVID. But um, yeah, no, I think there are approaches with uh, topical or intranasal administration of mRNA. There are some studies already which have shown that uh, can be effective. Um, and other approaches for, um, uh, for mucosal or um, outer surface administration to stimulate more of an IgA response uh, are happening. So I, I don't think yet though there's been uh, a quantum leap in that and, and hopefully that will happen. Time for one more question, Tom. Tom. Yeah. Yeah. This is for student teaching. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, I just want to make a comment on um, uh, these new approaches to vaccination, both uh, for the mRNA vaccines and also the physical yeah. ability to produce them in Australia. Uh, and what's how is that going to change approaches to Australian specific diseases like, you know, Murray Valley encephalitis yeah. or you know yeah. Ross River and the like. Yeah, so, um, and we're going to hear about encephalitis later today, which I'm looking forward to. Um, I know um, Barney Graham, who's on the advisory committee for MRA Victoria with us, thinks that some of those opportunities are what Australia should be really focusing on, because they, they are diseases that are peculiar to us. They may be generalizable to other forms of encephalitis, for example, um, but mRNA now makes it possible to think um, more acutely about them as targets. So absolutely, John, that the um, uh, opportunities there on the R&D space, that's the reason I showed the slide of Australian vaccines. We, we're not yet producing many candidates of our own, and I think we should be bold enough. And with the backup of the technology to allow us to get to that point, uh, with those industry partnerships especially, I think uh, Australian science can be more ambitious than it's been in the past. Jerry, that's a fantastic Absolutely. note to end on. Uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, that's, you know, I hope we stay emboldened about uh, progressing vaccines in Australia. Terrific talk. Thank you.